In this video, I'm going to show you some exercises that you can perform in order to train around a foot or an ankle injury. Now, these exercises are going to be especially useful when you are non load bearing, uh, essentially right after you have been injured. And most of them can be performed with minimal to no modifications. Now, unfortunately, I'm making this video because my wife, Lisa, recently fractured her fifth metatarsal. She can no longer run. She's a distance runner. And so most of these exercises are geared towards endurance athletes. That said, if you are a lifter or you participate in a sport where upper body size and strength are concerned, then of course you can continue to hammer the upper body hard and maybe bust through some plateaus in your upper body size and strength. That said, before you engage in any type of rigorous exercise, it's important to consult your physician first, especially immediately after an injury. Make sure that there's no pain with any of these before you begin. Now, I've separated these exercises into core stability and trunk movements, into lower body movements, and into upper body movements. And if you stick around until the end, I'll give you my thoughts on how to sequence them into a weekly training program. Now, when you do have an injured foot, core movements should absolutely still be performed, especially because uh, for those athletes who typically run and have uh, cutting or agility type work or jumping or if you're in the weight room and you're doing squats and deadlifts those use the core musculature more than most of us think and if we're not doing those then we can allow uh, weakness to creep in and some muscle atrophy to occur the first exercise here are side planks and we have some variations of side planks this one is side plank with a leg raise now these are performed from the knee in order to protect the injured foot uh, side planks challenge the internal and external obliques as well as the hip abductors uh, here we're adding in the straight leg raise which gets the hip abductors on the opposite side involved as well Next, we have clamshells added into the side plank. Clamshells get the gluteus minimus and medius involved in the movement uh, as they cause hip external rotation and abduction, as well as the tensor fascia latae, or TFL for short. And thirdly, we have side planks with a knee to elbow touch. Now, because the center of mass is being transferred out in front of Lisa when her limbs move forward, we are adding a, a rotational or an anti-rotational component to this movement. Again, facilitating dynamic trunk control as she's trying to keep her torso straight and keep it from twisting as her center of mass changes. Next, we have one that's familiar to most, which are bird dogs. We're reaching out with opposite limbs, trying to get long at the top, and then pulling the elbow into the knee. Now, this strengthens the erector spinae, the obliques, and the rectus abdominis, as long as you focus on drawing the belly button in towards the spine. Now, because we're working opposite limbs here, this does help train the crossed extensor reflex, and it challenges the balance and proprioception as well. The next movement is the straight leg dead bug. This can also be performed with the knees flexed at 90 degrees at the top, but with the knees straight, we are dynamically challenging hamstring flexibility. Now you wanna think about drawing the belly button into the spine here as you reach back and down with your limbs. Think about getting long at the bottom. And next we have supermans. Now remember, for athletes, squats and deadlifts and their variations, as well as dynamic movements on the fields will challenge lumbar erector strength. Uh, but when we don't have that because of injury, we need to stimulate it with something else. And so supermans are a great way to target the lumbar spinal erectors. Next, we have up and down planks. You can, of course, perform these uh, from a stationary position, a static plank, and you could perform them with one foot down and the other foot crossed over. We're doing it from the knees, though, in order to just protect this newly injured foot. And adding in the up and down component gives an anti-rotational uh, component to this exercise, and it also just increases the calorie burn. Next, we have lower abdominal crunches, just driving those feet up to the ceiling as you try to curl upwards from the hips. Next, we have bicycle crunches. Uh, this not only works the rectus abdominis and internal and external obliques, but the hip flexors as well. And next, we have V-ups. These are particularly challenging if you have limited hamstring flexibility again. However, they help to improve that very thing. Uh, do your best to keep your knees straight, and if you need to, I suggest resting for a few seconds in between repetitions if you, if you find that you're having to use momentum, or at least if you have to rely on momentum. Next, we have dumbbell Russian twists, another great dynamic trunk control exercise. Focus on keeping the chest proud and the shoulders back as you rotate. Now, if you use too heavy of a weight, it can be tempting to make this more of like a, bi a mini bicep curl exercise. 
don't focus on the weight, instead focus on the contraction of the abdomen. Next we have ab wheel rollouts. These are challenging at first. It can be hard to maintain this straight position through the spine and to keep your spine neutral. The temptation will be to let the belly sag towards the ground into spinal extension, but keep the belly button locked in, keep the glutes tight, and you don't have to go all the way down. Lisa is a pro at these, and so she's basically touching her nose to the ground, but you can actually go against the wall and use the wall as a stopping point to limit the range of motion and to help you reverse the movement on the way back. And then if you're able to get to a bar, you can do uh, hanging leg raise. You could also do its variations like toes to bar or a bent leg hanging leg raise or a curl up. Just know that no matter what you do, it's best to try to control the movement, try to limit the swing. As you can see, Lisa fighting to limit the swing here. Um, it also challenges the, your grip strength as well as your shoulder stabilizers um, as you try to keep your body mostly still and move the legs. Now, next we have lower body exercises, and I've left out things like leg extensions and hamstring curls because I know that a lot of you don't have those at home. I also don't have those at home in my garage, and all of these exercises are ones that Lisa does in the morning uh, during her workout when she trains in our garage. So I've limited them to things that could be done with relative ease at home. Now, first we have fire hydrants. A huge downside of lower extremity injuries is that our non-load bearing hip muscles can atrophy, especially the glutes. Now, fire hydrants target the hip abductors and external rotators, similar to clamshells. So think gluteus medius and gluteus minimus. Next, we have donkey kicks. And donkey kicks get the gluteus maximus involved. If you don't have a band like this, that's okay. You can even do these with just body weight, but some sort of a mini band or um, these thicker fabric bands work well. You can modify this by giving a two second pause at the top at peak contraction, just holding at the top in that um, extended position as well. Next we have clamshells. Now, previously we saw these from a side plank position. These are just from a lying position. And Lisa has her hips at 90 degrees right now. She'll also move her hips down a little bit more um, into uh, like 110, 120 degrees. And this, this just targets different motor units within those glute muscles to ensure that she has full development there. Now, one key important technique with clamshells is to keep your hips stacked, meaning that you want your pelvis perpendicular to the floor. She's keeping her top hand on her hip right around the iliac crest, just to be sure that her hips are stacked, one right on top of the other. You don't wanna lean back and then therefore artificially increase your range of motion. This is another version of the clamshell. This is the seated clamshell. I actually like this version more because you can work your glute muscles bilaterally uh, and you don't have to switch sides. So it's twice as fast because you're working both at once. Next, we have supine flutter kicks. We wanna keep the abdomen braced while performing these. The movement uh, creates a further bracing challenge, the movement of the legs. And this is getting the hip flexors and quads involved. If we flip over, now we have pl uh, prone flutter kicks. And from this position, the movement is driven more by the glutes and hamstrings. Next, we have another good glute exercise. This is frog pump kicks. Now, frog pump glute bridges tend to be done from the prone position, but they put pressure on the foot. So I like these frog pump kicks because it's open chain with no pressure on the potentially injured foot. Next are 45 degree back extensions with a glute emphasis. You'll notice that the pad is a little bit lower, uh, just lower or perhaps right at her hip crease. And you'll notice that Lisa set up with her injured leg kind of outside of the stirrup or outside of the, um, the place for her foot just so that she doesn't hurt it. On these, we wanna really focus on that peak glute contraction at the top. You can do them weighted or unweighted as you see Lisa doing here. Now again, there is a lot of variation you can do with any of these exercises. For instance, this one, you could hold at the top or uh, with each rep, or you could even hold at the top and do some sort of a, a unilateral or bilateral dumbbell row. Here we see her doing 
back extensions with more of a lumbar spine emphasis, uh, getting the lumbar spinal erectors involved. We move the pad up just about an inch, so now it's above her hip crease, and she's forced to go into more lumbar flexion and then lumbar extension at the top. And again, we can do these weighted or we can do them unweighted, as we'll see here in a second. Now, as I said in the intro, if you have a lower body injury, you can of course still keep training your upper body, especially if your sport requires upper body size and strength, or if that's one of your goals. So uh, by all means, get after the bench presses and the weighted chin ups, and probably not things like push pressing, um, but just other big barbell and dumbbell movements. Given that Lisa is a distance runner and she's not used to training her upper body quite as much, uh, the movements that I've included here are more basic. Uh, they can be done with uh, dumbbells if you don't have access to barbells, and I'm only showing a few variations, but just know that the variations are endless. So first we have resistance band rows, and these of course are working the lats, the posterior deltoids, biceps, and the scapular retractor muscles. Notice that Lisa is pulling her scapulae back into retraction with each rep. She's keeping her chest proud. And also know that you can set up the bands at any angle. They can be vertical, they can be diagonal, or horizontal, or anywhere in between those. Next, we have the dumbbell bench press. The dumbbell bench press and all of its variations strengthen the pecs, the anterior deltoids, and the triceps. We want to make sure that those scapula are retracted and locked into position on the bench. Keep the chest proud and think about pulling the dumbbells down into position, down towards your chest. And we wanna keep those upper arms at about a 45 degree angle, give or take 10 degrees to the body. We don't want the elbows straight out to the side, nor do, nor do we want them hugging in close to the body. Next we have dumbbell YTWLs, and these are similar to reverse flies in that they work the lower traps and the rhomboids, but this uh, particular movement also helps to strengthen the external rotator cuff muscles. You'll need to use a very light weight on these at first. You may notice that Lisa isn't quite able to get her arms up to horizontal on the W's and on the T's. She has a bit of uh, mobility sort of restriction issues in her pec minor and maybe needs lighter dumbbells. So go very light on these at first. Next, we have push-ups and all of their variations. Here, Lisa's doing them from the knees in order to protect her newly injured foot. Notice that her body, her torso, is a straight line, no sagging of, um, of the lumbar spine and no bowing of the hips. Next, we have chin-ups and their variations. Here, we see Lisa doing an eccentric or a negative chin-up where she uses her good leg to jump into position with the chest up to the bar and then slowly lowering herself down. I think she's doing about a three count or a four count on these. Now the week after she broke her foot, she started doing these negatives. She could do maybe one strict pull up. And by the end of eight weeks, she was able to bust out five strict pull ups in a row in an unbroken set. So these absolutely do work and they absolutely will help to improve your upper body strength. Now, of course, you could do these with some assistance uh, like a resistance band or a chin up machine. But if you don't have access to those, then those eccentric pull-ups will work as well. So those were all of the exercises that Lisa started using right after she broke her foot from about week two, once she was cleared to exercise, um, up until she could start to bear a little bit of weight on that side. Now, my recommendation for how to incorporate these into a training program would be to select two or three uh, exercises from each category based on what you have available in your home or at the gym to set a timer and then to go based on time. Maybe it's one minute on, 30 seconds off, and to move through these. Don't rush too quickly at first because of course you want to make sure that you don't accidentally trip or kick something with your injured limb um, and that you don't cause further pain to it. But as you get used to it, you can now move quickly from exercise to exercise. So we can not only continue to hopefully maintain some of that muscle mass and strength that you gained pre-injury, uh, but also we get the heart rate elevated a little bit, which is very hard to do considering that you're, it's your foot that's injured and you're not getting in the steps, you're not doing any kind of uh, cardiovascular work, and the metabolic demands of your day are just very low. And so that's why I would encourage you to incorporate this into a circuit training uh, type of session so that the heart rate stays high and we get some of that metabolic stimulus. Now the goal would be over time to increase the number of reps that you can do for that time period 
to lengthen the time period and or to increase the load on any of those exercises. All right, guys, now thanks for watching this video and stick around for part two of this video coming out soon, which is going to show some of the transitional exercises that Lisa started doing once she could bear a little bit of weight on that injured side in a safe way. Don't forget to check out some of my other playlists if you're into leveling up your coaching game, learning about sports science, or if you want to hear some exciting new announcements that I have coming to you guys soon. As always, I'll catch you guys on the next video. Dr. Good is here back with another lecture.